Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Litvak, uh, Vice President for Scholars uh, at the Woodrow Wilson Center and Director of International Security Studies. I'd like to welcome you to today's meeting, a special event to mark the publication of uh, the new book by Professor Bob Lee, Robert Lieber, Power and Willpower in the American Future, Why the United States is Not Destined to Decline. And today's session is billed as Why the United States is Not Destined to Decline, a debate because we're delighted that uh, we're joined today as well by Professor Michael Ben Mandelbaum uh, of, of uh, Johns Hopkins uh, SICE um, uh, to uh, provide an alternative uh, perspective on, on this issue. Um, the Wilson Center um, uh, has, I think, created a uh, distinctive niche in Washington of trying to examine what are the underlying assumptions that drive policy without taking policy pre prescriptions. It's almost a kind of policy hygiene to like identify what are the, 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 these key assumptions that are the drivers of policy. And in conjunction with that, my program has done, um, all that's by way of providing context to the contemporary policy debates. My program has had a series, um, Ideas in American Foreign Policy, and I think Michael, uh, you, you have spoken in that series before in one of your prior publications. Um, uh, that highlights important new books in the field of American foreign policy that are going to become focal points of, de of, of, of debate. Um, and the new book uh, by Bob Lieber, which is uh, available for purchase outside at the end of this uh, uh, session, uh, is just such a book. Um, uh, not a, it, it's written with a perspective, as we'll hear, uh, and it's one that, uh, um, uh, because uh, international relations is not the law of thermodynamics that other people can uh, take issue with, and we'll hear from uh, from Michael Mandelbaum on that to have a, uh, a, 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 a thorough discussion of, 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 of these issues. By way of introduction, Bob Lieber is professor at Georgetown University's Department of, Polit of Government and, he's, and the McDonough School of Business, where he teaches on American foreign policy and U.S. relations with the Middle East and Europe. Uh, he is a, I'm proud to say, a, uh, uh, delighted to say, a, a Wilson F Center uh, fellow, um, and he's received various other foundations, Guggenheim, Rockefeller, et cetera. He's been a visiting fellow uh, at the Atlantic Institute in Paris, Brookings Institution here in Washington, uh, Fudan University in Shanghai. Uh, he's published widely on uh, the issues of, of American foreign policy in the Middle East. Uh, his books include um, uh, The American Era, uh, Power and Strategy for the 21st Century. Uh, a variety of other articles, and he's edited a, a, a series which has really, um, I think, uh, uh, had an influence on, on uh, kind of thinking uh, episodically, which is this uh, Eagle Rules series that he's had. And Bob, is there another Eagle Rules in, in the works, or uh, are you maxed out after? We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Um, uh, his last, the last one was Eagle Rules, Foreign Policy and American Primacy in the 21st Century. So uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Bob Lieber back at the Wilson Center. Uh, Michael Mandelbaum is uh, the Christian A. Herder Professor of American Foreign Policy at Johns Hopkins University, where he directs the American Foreign Policy Program. Uh, he had previously taught at Harvard University, Columbia University, and the U.S. Naval Academy. Um, he has uh, worked at the Department of State. He's been a senior fellow at the Council on Re Foreign Relations. Um, so many books, uh, the latest were uh, That Used to Be Us, How America Fell Behind in the World It Invented, uh, and How We Can Come Back, uh, which was co-authored with uh, uh, Tom Friedman. Uh, I take it he may be drawing a bit from that book for some of his presentation today, uh, and has published articles in uh, all of the, the known uh, prominent journals, Foreign Affairs, published in, in op-eds in Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, etc. So. Um, the format today is uh, we'll hear, for, hear first from uh, Bob Lieber, who will take 10, 15 minutes max to lay out kind of the thesis of the book. Um, he will be followed by um, Michael Mandelbaum, uh, who will uh, speak for a similar period of time, maybe more on the 10, 10 minute side, just sort of lay out sort of the alternative perspective. Then we'll come uh, uh, back uh, to these seats and in the vernacular, discuss amongst ourselves for a few minutes and then open it up for comments and questions for the floor. So with that, my pleasure to well, uh, introduce Bob Lieber. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, I appreciate the Wilson Center and your program hosting this. I'm honored to have uh, Mike Mandelbaum, both a uh, worthy adversary and a friend, to uh, debate these ideas. I think they're central to uh, America's place in the world today, and certainly welcome your um, observations and questions. I, I like to say that I was born and raised in Chicago, uh, 
uh, which gives me a certain, as uh, Chicagoans do have, a kind of earthy, pragmatic, and direct sensibility. So when the question period comes, uh, don't hesitate to ask me a direct, even tough question. Unlike um, some of my more sensitive um, uh, colleagues here on the East Coast, you don't have to worry that you might hurt my feelings. So with that preface, uh, let me begin. And again, thank you all for, for, for coming. And I'm also pleased to see a number of familiar faces uh, in the audience. Um, the heart of my argument is in the subtitle of the, uh, the book. Um, the subtitle does not say why the U.S. will not decline. It says why the U.S. is not destined to decline. In doing so, I tried to capture the contingent aspect of this question. In other words, decline is not a fate. It's not baked in the cake. Um, it has to do with whether or not uh, America in its leadership, policy, choices, and resolve makes the necessary uh, decisions or not. Uh, I'm relatively optimistic about how this will unfold, but uh, it's, it's a question of the choices we make. Um, I argue we're not destined to decline but with these caveats. Uh, let me begin by noting that the idea of decline at home and abroad is uh, pervasive. Uh, this morning, as I got my uh, uh, notes ready for my talk, I went to Google and I typed in decline of America. It produced 78 million hits. Uh, the Chinese and other foreigners say it and think it. Uh, the American public is pessimistic. In a February poll, 46% of Americans say our best days are behind it. The idea is widely expressed by authors, pundits, and public intellectuals, and it's, uh, it concerns not only the economy, but education, the wider society, foreign policy, and so forth. It's Bignav Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's former national security advisor and a prolific author, says that the American people are uniquely, quote, ignorant, unquote. I know he said it because I heard him do it on his book interview on the Jim Lehrer News Hour. Uh, saying they're ignorant, I think, is a translation of they don't pay enough attention to Zbig. Um, Steve Walt, in a foreignpolicy.com piece some months ago, referred to Americans as a nation of, a, quote, a nation of swaggering sheep, unquote, which to me says that he's even more fr frustrated then it's big, because not only don't they pay any attention to him, they ignore him altogether. Um, Superman, if you um, have uh, kids or grandkids or friends who look at comic books, Superman has given up his American citizenship, according to a story that appeared some months ago. Uh, but more sage and thoughtful observers also warn of decline. One of the people I respect most, one of my old professors from grad school, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, has written, quote, the United States cannot afford another decline like that which has characterized the past decade and a half. Only self-delusion can keep us from admitting our decline to ourselves. Um, sounds compelling. Uh, the problem with that is that Kissinger wrote those words in 1961 in his book, The Necessity for Choice. Now, Kissinger is a smart guy and one of the most thoughtful of the foreign policy sages uh, of the last half century. But much of this discourse has been exaggerated, hyperbolic, and, his, and ahistorical. Why is that the case? Well, I think too much emphasis has been placed on material factors, and especially short-run extrapolations of material factors. In fact, we certainly do face serious problems at home. Michael Mandelbaum has written eloquently about him in his excellent little book, uh, and here I'm referring to um, his book, The Frugal Superpower, not the one co-authored with Tom Friedman. There has been some attrition in our relative standing abroad vis-a-vis -vis other states, especially with the rising powers, uh, although our margin vis-a-vis -vis other actors still remains uh, very substantial. Uh, the costs of entitlements, health care, and so forth are uh, very serious matters. Uh, federal taxes, federal revenues compared to what the federal government spends uh, are a growing and serious uh, medium 
and even long-term problem. Uh, something has to be done, in short, about debt deficit and entitlements. But I'll also note that a, if you go back a, a quarter century, the things that were being said about Japan then are very similar to what's being said about China now. I don't minimize the importance of China, but let me read you a quote from uh, uh, a book written by two prominent Japanese authors, one one of the founders of Sony, the other a prominent Japanese politician, writing in the late uh, 80s, uh, Akiko, Akio Morita proclaimed, quote, we are going to have a totally new configuration in the balance of power in the world. And um, Shintaro Ishihara, a leading uh, Japanese political figure, observed, quote, there is no hope for the United States. That was um, uh, 25 years ago, a blink uh, of the eye historically. The, um, uh, the issue here is that in material terms, the United States is really not badly off. Um, by all the indicators with which we measure power, if you step back a bit, the American uh, pr position is really far more favorable than uh, we often give it credit for. Uh, this is a very different proposition from the analogy used by Paul Kennedy and others, Kennedy writing about the rise and fall of the great powers, but many other authors who explicitly or implicitly assume the U.S. is recapitulating the cycle of decline experienced by the British Empire uh, beginning uh, a century ago, that is, in the decade before World War I. But Britain by that time, 100 years ago, had already been surpassed in gross domestic product, in troop strength and steel production by the United States and Germany. By contrast, despite some attrition in America's relative position, the American margin vis-a-vis -vis others still remains enormous, unlike the situation of the British a century ago. If you look at the size, breadth, depth of our economy and financial markets, um, I think the, uh, the statement remains accurate. The U.S. Gross domestic product as measured in terms of market exchange rates, which is the indicator the IMF prefers, making the argument that using purchasing power parity, which is what you typically read about, is misleading when you want to do international uh, comparisons. By that measure, the U.S. represents 21 percent of world gross domestic product, uh, the Chinese 10.5 percent, exactly half of the American uh, share. If you look at, at GDP per capita, again in market exchange rates, the American margin vis-a-vis -vis China is about 8 to 1 at the present time. In military technology, weaponry, the capacity for power projection, uh, the U.S. is in a class by itself, even with the impending defense cuts. Moreover, we have fought two wars. We still have one significant one going on, and yet today, with an enormous defense budget, which dwarfs that of the next 10 or a dozen powers combined, we are spending merely 4.7 percent of gross domestic product. That is a lot of money in absolute terms, but it's 4.7 percent of GDP, a number which will drop uh, later in this decade, just beyond the middle of the decade, to about 3.6 percent of GDP. Again, it's still a lot of money, but you have to say compared to what? Compared to American history of the, of the Cold War and post-Cold War years, that's less than we spent uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s um, uh, by a considerable margin, again, as a share of U.S. GDP. I have all the data in the book, and I'm just delighted to sign for anyone who wants to pick up a copy. We have the world's leading research universities, uh, we lead the world in research and development, science, high-tech, innovative capacity. Our population is the third largest in the world. Our demographic balance, despite the retirement of the baby boomers, remains more favorable than for any of the Europeans, the Japanese, or the Chinese because of the one-child policy. Uh, we all have a uh, favorable, uh, not only demographic profile compared to our competitors, but America still remains a magnet for the best and the brightest from all over the world. Our landmass and geography benefit us. 
Our competitiveness is the largest among major countries, um, uh, not compared to Singapore and Finland, but the U.S. on all the rankings continues to stand out. Our energy resources are something uh, which, again, is a tremendous asset for the United States. Thanks to a revolution in technology and entrepreneurship, in oil and gas, we're experiencing a renaissance, which is having an enormous impact on our vulnerability and our competitiveness in a very positive way. It's something that has just developed recently in the last few years. It is an enormous asset for America. If I had more time, I would elaborate, but I want to be uh, concise. It's, it, it, by and large, though, it's a breakthrough and a reversal of what I think all of us who write about these questions until uh, four or five years ago assumed to be the case. That is a case of stringency, the gradual depletion of oil and gas resources, and not only an electable growth in imports, but a growing vulnerability in terms of risks to our energy, to our security and economy from events happening halfway around the world. Um, instead, in short, of the material factors on which so much of the emphasis has been placed, the real uh, decider in terms of America's future has to do with what I call ideational matters rather than material ones. These are matters of policy, belief, leadership, and choices, especially about debt, deficit, and entitlements. Uh, here I agree to some extent with Mike Mandelbaum about the importance of those things. Mike is much more pessimistic. My own view is that we got ourselves into a huge problem with debt and deficit in the last decade or so. It came on relatively quickly, and while the retirement of the baby boomers and the growth in health care costs means these are stubborn and difficult problems to resolve, um, the uh, growing severity of the issue, the, the uh, ominous projection of trends, means that policymakers and the Congress really are going to have to grapple with this. I'm cautiously optimistic, ironically, because the worst things get the better. That is, the more acute the sense of crisis, I think, uh, means that sooner or later, policymakers in the Congress and in the, and this administration or the next one are going to have to have no choice but to get a handle on these problems. There are viable means of coping with these. It doesn't assure that Congress and the President will do so, but I'm cautiously optimistic because they will uh, have to do it since they have very little choice um, uh, in budget and practical terms. Um, to, in a, uh, just to, be, uh, to encapsulate these things, in addition to coping with the problems I'm cited, we have to get energy policy right to do what's effective, not what's fashionable or politically correct. We need, desperately need tax and immigration policy reforms, and we need a foreign policy which is prudent, not one which involves retrenchment or withdrawal or disengagement, but to use a basketball metaphor, uh, to, uh, to use smart shot selection, but our engagement abroad is critical. The U.S. is the power which underpins stability uh, around the world. The liberal international order in all its various forms rests heavily on American engagement. U.S. disengagement would be dysfunctional not only for America's own interests, but uh, in terms of regional security, nuclear proliferation, prosperity, rules of the game, free passage on the high seas, and so forth. Ultimately, I'm uh, relatively optimistic uh, as much for reasons of path dependency and national character as anything else. The American uh, response to crisis over the 230-some-odd years uh, of America's uh, political history has in the end shown uh, that sooner or later Americans get a handle on the major problems they face. Here I want to finish with two quotes, one from Alexis de Tocqueville, in Democracy in America, written in the 1830s. Quote, the great privilege of the Americans does not consist in being more enlightened than any other nations, but in being able to repair the faults they may commit. Unquote. Churchill, a more familiar quote to you about a century and a half later, more or less says the same thing. 
quote, Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after they have exhausted all of their possibilities, unquote. The bottom line, then, we have the capacity, we have the resources. Decline is a choice, not a fate. In short, America is not destined to decline. Thank you. say I was uh, struck by one of the lines you quoted at the beginning, Bob, that Americans are uniquely ignorant. This seems to me to be an extraordinarily parochial statement. Americans may be ignorant, but we're certainly not uniquely ignorant. And anybody who thinks that other peoples are models of cosmopolitanism and sophistication ought to get out more. That was big. Well... Um, um, uh, Bob and I are old friends, and we usually agree about just about everything. So the question that I have to address is, where do we differ? Well, one difference is that this is Bob's second book on this subject, whereas I myself have written, by my count, three, <laughs> which demonstrates something that uh, all of our friends and certainly our wives know, which is that Bob is at least 50% more efficient than I am. Um, it's also the case that uh, running through his two books and my three, the case for Goliath, the frugal superpower, and that used to be us, for those of you who are interested, are uh, at least three broad areas of agreement. And, and one might conclude, and you may conclude, that the agreements are more important than the disagreements. But let me begin with the agreements. First, we agree that the United States remains the only plausible global leader. There really is no substitute for what those of you who are Bob's PhD students here know as global public goods. There's no substitute uh, for the United States in providing them. Uh, I think at this point one doesn't need to make the case that Europe is not going to be a global superpower. Uh, and uh, I agree with Bob that while China is certainly going to become increasingly important, it's not going to take on this role anytime soon or probably ever. The second area of agreement is that the unique position of the United States is, on the whole, a good thing. Uh, and I would say, here we open up an area of discussion that is not precisely germane to the book, but let me make the point anyway. This is as good a thing for other countries as it is for the United States. Indeed, in some ways, the role that the United States plays is a service and a poorly comp a compensated service to other countries. So uh, the, what is desirable is the continuation of this role, and there we agree. And third, we agree that the United States is not destined to decline or to abandon or cut back severely on this role because nothing is foreordained. But it is true that I am more pessimistic than Bob, and for this greater pessimism, there are three reasons, and, and these reasons form the heart of my prepared remarks. They have to do with deficits, with politics, and with the prospects for economic growth. And let me say a brief word about each of them. Uh, first, deficits. Uh, the argument of my book, The Frugal Superpower, is that impending spending increases on the part of the American government because of the entitlement payments due the so-called baby boom generation, those of us born between 1946 and 1964, will create unsustainable deficits and force significant cutbacks to foreign and security policy. Now, it is true, and Bob makes this case well, that the future is not wholly predictable. But predictions based on demography, and that is what this prediction is based on, are pretty reliable. We pretty much know how many people will be what age 
at what point in time and what benefits they will be able to claim. And we know, not with the same certainty, but with pretty good confidence, that all other things being equal and absent political changes that I'll mention in a moment, the cost of health care, which is what my generation will be increasingly paying for, which is to say what the rest of you will increasingly be paying for through Medicare, that cost, which is the principal driver of these benefits, will increase. It always has because of something that the, the late great Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan called Baumol's Law after the NYU economist William Baumol, who posited that the cost of services always goes up, and because technology improves health care but becomes increasingly expensive. So uh, deficits, if unattended politically, will increase dramatically, placing huge pressures on the American budget. Now, there are two objections to this assertion, and they come under the heading of politics. First, it is true that political choices could curtail the cost of entitlements, and especially health care, freeing resources for foreign policy. This could happen, it should happen, and eventually it will happen because the deficits in prospect really are unsustainable. But it doesn't look set to happen anytime soon because in order for this to happen, our American political system has to function appropriately, and it shows no sign of doing this. And that is one of the subjects of the book that I wrote with Tom Friedman, That Used to Be Us. Now, there's another objection to this deficit-driven pessimism about American foreign policy, and that is the fact, and it is a fact, that foreign policy is not the largest driver of deficits. This huge increase in governmental obligations comes almost exclusively from entitlements. In fact, it has been said by a number of people, among them myself, that at this point in American history, the American government can be seen as a large insurance company that dabbles in foreign policy on the side. So it could be argued, and it uh, has been argued and probably will be argued in the presidential campaign, that foreign policy should be set to one side, should not be affected by these budget problems, that you can't solve the problem, really, just by cutting defense spending. And that's true, but it seems to me politically somewhere between improbable and impossible that as the country is forced to come to terms with this deficit problem, foreign and security problem will be spared, will remain untouched, will be regarded as sacrosanct. And evidence for that is legislation that's now on the books. As part of the deal to raise the American debt ceiling, a commission to cut the budget was established, but it was stipulated that if that commission, consisting of both Democrats and Republicans, failed to agree on substantial reductions, then automatic reductions that fall heavily on defense spending would take effect. Well, of course, the commission failed to agree, and those reductions, with an emphasis on reductions in the defense budget, will take effect unless nothing is done beginning next year. Now, something may well be done, but not enough to spare, I predict, the defense budget. That brings me to the third reason for pessimism, economic growth. Economic growth is the solution to this and almost every other social problem, or at least it's part of the solution. High economic growth moderates, eases the trade-offs that America as a society through its political system is forced to make. Now, as Bob rightly notes, we cannot predict the future of economic growth. That's true partly because economic growth in a rich country such as the United States depends heavily on increases in productivity, and no one has been able satisfactorily to analyze the sources of productivity, let alone predict its future course. And it's also true, as Bob notes, that history is full of surprises, some of them, not all of them, alas, but some of them pleasant ones. The discovery of the capacity to tap huge reserves of natural gas that Bob mentioned is an example. So we might get lucky. It's true. But 
the kind of economic growth that the United States experienced after World War II, 4 percent per year and higher, which enabled the country to grow out of a deficit proportionately even greater than the one we have now, a deficit acquired for much better reason for the purposes of fighting World War II, that level of economic growth seems, at least to me, and I think to most economic observers, all things considered, unlikely. Doesn't mean it won't happen, it means that it is unwise to count on. Now, economic performance affects foreign policy through public opinion. In the United States, where foreign policy is concerned, we have a two-tiered foreign policy. The government and the foreign policy elite and anybody who comes to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars to hear Bob and me qualifies as part of the foreign policy elite, we take the initiative. And the public as a whole decides whether these initiatives are acceptable. The public, that is, sets the boundaries of what is politically permissible. And my concern is that those boundaries are likely to become narrower as Americans have to pay more to their government and get fewer benefits from it. That, I believe, will make for less American foreign policy, and that, Bob and I agree, is not a good thing. So, to summarize, uh, Bob and I agree on what American foreign policy ought to be. We disagree on what it is likely to be, which leads me to my final point. I hope he's right. Thank you. Thank you both for They can talk amongst themselves. Holy Roman Empire, not the Holy Roman or an Empire, you know, in World, World War II. And uh, just be a second. Maybe. They're taping this. This bit will be edited out, but anyway. We good? Technology. <laughs> this guy is good. You must be doing the army. You must be that girl about assembling <laughs> rifles in the dark. He's a very good at this. <laughs> okay. Great. We good? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. As we were saying, um, thank you for those excellent uh, opening presentations. Let me begin with a question or two to each of you. We will open it up to the, to the audience. Um, first, a question for, for Bob. Um, Bob, uh, Sam Huntington had a, a famous article talking about sort of this periodicity of declinism or whatever. And the question in the current circumstances is kind of, is it different this time? You know, how do you address that in, 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 in your book? I mean, is it different or, or is it just part of the way the sine curve? As a matter of fact, I do have a, a section called Is It Different Now? Um, it's a good question, uh, but the, um, uh, the likelihood is that it's, while it is, of course, each, each period is different, each crisis is different over the years, but if we're speaking uh, over the sweep of American history, no. The crises that the U.S. faced in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, 
the dysfunctional uh, adversarial politics at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th, uh, certainly was worse than what we face right now. The Civil War, the Depression of the 1930s, when people thought the American political system and with it Western notions of liberal democracy and market capitalism were simply not suitable for the modern era and that mm -hmm. the future was the kind of centrally directed state capitalism of the fascist powers such as Nazi Germany and fascist Italy which quote made the trains run on time or of Stalin's Soviet Union with its forced draft industrialization. Uh, after World War II and in the um, as, as early as 1957 with the uh, launch of Sputnik the voices saying that the Soviet model was more disciplined, more focused, more math and science, that uh, we were lagging and the rest of it was characteristic of how we responded and again in the 70s with the two oil shocks, the withdrawal from Vietnam, the high unemployment and hyperinflation at the end of the uh, 70s, beginning of the 80s, uh, we've been here before. That doesn't necessarily mean that we will do this right. I stress the word contingency, but the unique feature of American society, and those of you who are here in the audience who've come from other foreign lands, either earlier in your lives or now, I think have some sense that the flexibility and adaptability of the United States is unique uh, for any large country. Uh, it suggests that this capacity, as expressed by Tocqueville or Churchill, to remedy our faults remains an enormous underlying asset. And just in, in quick reply to a point that Mike Mandelbaum made, um, a lot of the very ominous projections about where we'll be because of health care costs, debt, deficit, entitlements, and the impact of the baby boomers rests on certain kinds of assumptions and parameters that go into these models. But these are heavily dependent on things like economic growth and the assumptions about uh, the entitlement terms. There, are, uh, there have been efforts. The Simpson-Bowles Commission, appointed by President Obama, came in with a very ambitious proposal um, which would have made a good deal of sense and which was, which uh, I think also alienated people across the political spectrum, which was a good sign. The president deserves credit for appointing the commission. He deserves discredit for ducking when they came in with the kinds of recommendations that would have made a difference. I think there's every reason to expect that after the election, no matter who wins, more sensible adult voices will be required to uh, address these kinds of problems. You know, it's interesting to kind of listen to your, your um, dialogue, uh, you know, two kind of reference points. Look, one is the difference with the past, whereas, you know, one had um, Paul Kennedy's book that it was basically there was this, this, this overextension that was sort of a driver of how we would kind of overspend ourselves, uh, you know, in, in foreign adventures as a, as a cause of decline, or that there would be a rising power like Japan in the late 80s or, or China now. Now, that really didn't enter in as much as into your discussion. Um, that's sort of one point, sort of the differences between, uh, you know, now and, 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 and then. But also uh, a difference between kind of another debate between two kind of famous interlocutors in American foreign policy, uh, John Eikenberry and Bob Kagan. And theirs had to do with sort of, th that was in the more traditional kind of inter liberalism versus realism in, in foreign policy, you know, where Eikenberry, John Eikenberry at Princeton argued that uh, the rise of the rest, uh, the uh, uh, BRICS, uh, was a, is really a, um, uh, a product of American success in building a post-World War II international uh, system. The Kagan line, not to kind of caricature it, is just concerned about rising powers, Russia and China. What was striking in, in, in your exchange, and particularly, Michael, in your prescription of what went wrong was, it's really almost, you emphasize more on what's wrong, going wrong on, kind of with us. It's, it's sort of the uh, deficits, politics, economic growth. It had less to do with the, that one of these uh, brick were going to kind of over, 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 overtake us. So how would you place your own kind of uh, comments into that context? The past, the difference with uh, kind of the, uh, the, the Paul Kennedy uh, earlier period of declinism, and then, and then secondly, like slotting your debate into sort of the uh, Eikenberry Kagan, uh, you know, dialogue, which uh, has, has been gotten quite a bit of, of, of attention. Why don't we start with Michael, and then we'll, we'll turn to Bob. Uh, well, uh, you, you've uh, laid out a lot of issues yeah. there, Rob. Um, 
The, the Paul Kennedy book, uh, which is, uh, is a very good book, and it really is a kind of a synthesis of uh, 500 years of diplomatic history, and at the very end, it tacked on a few words about the United States, and it came out at just the time when people were worried about Japan, and so it got a lot of publicity there. But in fact, uh, the, I mean, the argument of the book uh, is that uh, power is an, international power is self-liquidating because a country wins a big war, it gets a big empire, it spends a lot of money uh, tending that empire, and then the next big war, it doesn't have that that uh, tending the empire undercuts economic growth, and in the next big war, it doesn't it isn't rich enough to win, and so it uh, it yields to. Uh, to, the, to the successor, and that works from the Spanish Habsburgs to the British. Uh, and in fact, the book turned out to be correct. It turned out to be spot on about the Soviet Union, not about the United States. But uh, we're not going to have another big war, or if we do, it's going to destroy everything. And so who emerges from it will be the least of our, our concerns. So that pattern, I think, mm -hmm. because of nuclear weapons and other things, has probably uh, come to an end. Um, the, the, uh, uh, let, let me make one other point. I'm not responding. I'm not being particularly responsive, but I hope I'm being modestly responsive to what you said. Uh, Bob made a, a, a good point about the trajectory of American foreign policy. It tends to be crisis-driven. It, it uh, you know, America is the sleeping giant. Somebody comes along and pokes it, wakes up, and then starts uh, doing all kinds of things, beginning uh, with the origins of the Cold War between 45 and 47, the Korean War, which led to, I think, a tripling or quadrupling of the defense budget and the, the militarization of containment. Uh, Sputnik was a big deal. The, in, the in Soviet invasion of Afghanistan made a big difference. And, of course, 9-11, mm -hmm. which gave us two wars. But uh, the... the the problem, if, you can, if one can say that, with our, what I regard as our current problems is that it's not a visible crisis. It just drifts along and drifts downward. So uh, by, by that standard, and I'm not suggesting that Bob is insisting that that's the way things must work, but it is the way things have worked in the past, it takes a shock, an external crisis, to get the country mobilized and motivated to deal with its problems. And uh, the problems that we face now are not shocking. So if to the extent that that's true, we're going to have to wait for some major crisis, some dollar crisis or something like that. And that's, mm -hmm. that's not a very happy scenario. Um, first on the conceptual question you asked, Michael and I agree about the unique uh, role of the United States in sustaining what we come to take for granted as the liberal international order, which doesn't just mean uh, economic institutions and international institutions, but means regional stability, uh, law, uh, the laws of how countries do things, the uh, assumptions about uh, international order broadly understood in economic, political, and security terms, realms. Um, where I disagree with Eikenberry emphatically is he argues that the rising powers, the so-called BRICS, not least China, will become stakeholders, quote-unquote, um, as their power and wealth increases, and that in particular of the Europeans, Japanese, and by implication the United States ebbs. Mm -hmm. um, I disagree emphatically. If you look at the record, if you look at enumerate issues or issue areas, nuclear proliferation, regional security, intellectual property rights, currency parities, uh, human rights, humanitarian intervention, uh, war crimes, uh, the whole uh, uh, agenda of things internationally, there's very little evidence that China or Brazil or India are in fact acting to support collective action endeavors and the existing rules of the road in these realms. I think Eikenberry makes a terrible mistake in that regard, and the critique is not only that of people like Michael and me, but Kagan, as you've mentioned, I'd add Walter Russell Mead as another author who makes a, a related point. Uh, however, as far as the United States goes, uh, if we don't grapple with our economic uh, issues at home, specifically debt, deficit, and entitlements, sooner or later we will face a crisis, whether it's a run on the dollar or the inability to finance uh, the, the, the debt, mm -hmm. uh, a, a la the European situation. Think of Spain 
uh, looming now, or recently Greece and others. The U.S. is in a unique position in many respects, and the more shaky the world economy had gotten during the crisis, the more the U.S. remains uh, and even enhances its, its position as the safest, as a safe haven for investment, capital, and so forth. But sooner or later, if, if the trends were to continue, mm -hmm. uh, they would have to be addressed. In that sense, the more acute the sense of crisis, the more likely we'll get a handle on it. One related factor here, Michael is right to cite economic growth, but the, there are a number of things out there that suggest that the U.S. retains bases for a more optimistic projection, not necessarily the post-World War II rates, but much better ones than we've been experiencing lately as a result of the enormous breakthroughs in energy, an energy renaissance. There are calculations, for example, by some of the kinds of people who Mike and I would point to as authorities in the energy realm that the, these, the boost in um, uh, tight oil, in shale gas, and so forth between now and 2020 could increase GDP by a, a, an additional 2 to 3 percent, uh, result in millions of more jobs, technological breakthroughs, greater competitiveness for American industries of all kinds, provided federal energy policy doesn't screw it up, to, to be blunt. Um, I'm not suggesting this is a deus ex machina. This is a vast economy, but in nanotechnology, biotechnology, um, uh, microelectronics and other realms, the U.S. retains enormous advantages as reflected in our research universities and so forth. Um, uh, the constant innovation and so forth remains an enormous underlying strength of the United States. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it will happen, but it suggests we have resources that people often overlook when they make these projections. Let's, let's get some questions from the floor. We have microphones on the side. Um, who would like to... Um, the gentleman there, and then, then Victor. One second. Uh, first gentleman, yeah. First. Right behind him, Tim. Okay. That gentleman. Thank you. Can you identify Listen, your please, self? Bert of Mines, former uh, principal economist at the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, we're living in, in a time of pessimism right now. <laughs> so we all worry very much about fiscal deficits and external indebtedness. In times of optimism, we look at growth and we look at basically improving our lot. But we're, we're all, and the media works a little bit in that respect, in, in that direction. We're now in a pessimist period. But we're overlooking a few things. You mentioned at some point 4% growth in the past and now we fall back on 3% and 2.5%. Same thing. The difference is just explained by the difference in population growth or the growth in the labor force. <coughs> we're just as productive as we were in, in those days. That's one thing. The other thing that we like to look at, we are worried about the cost of health care. Well, that has to do with the delivery system. Uh, Europe has the same outcome in health care as the U.S., but it pays on average 10% of GDP, whereas the U.S. is paying 17 or 18% of GDP. We may have to look at savings in the way we are delivering it. The same in energy consumption. We worry very much about that, but it Ford and General Motors built cars that are 20 or 25% more fuel efficient in Europe. The technology is not only there, they have it, but they're not applying it because of the low cost of energy in this country. Another area where potential savings can be held. But what I'm much more worried about is that we have economize so much on education, which is very essential to the development process, that we are falling back to number 23 in terms of mass and science and technology on an OECD scale of 30 countries. That's very, very questionable. The other one is my fourth point. We're talking about fiscal deficit, but we forget one thing. Fiscal revenue in this country is 24% of GDP. That's the lowest level of all of the OECD countries. We may have to look a little bit more Thank you. With more bravery than, than we do right now on that issue. Let's collect a few comments and then we'll let our, our panels respond. Victor, you go ahead and then Yafeng. People, we're, we're getting close to the end, so con short comments okay, would be appreciated, or questions actually. Uh, I'm Victor Bass, your consultant in national security policy. 
I agree 100% with Dr. M uh, Mendelbaum that uh, the key problem as far as the deficit is concerned uh, and the debt is concerned is uh, health care. And the cost of health care is tremendous. Now, it's going to grow, too, because people are aging, and uh, it will require more, uh, more attention, more money, and so on and so forth. But there is a solution for it, which is way, way outside of the conventional wisdom and frightens lots of people. Namely, I have been following uh, biogerontology for about 10 years, and biogerontologists, key biogerontologists are telling me that uh, they can increase human longevity without age-related diseases. This is critical. Without age-related diseases, for 20 years, if they obtain adequate funding, and adequate funding, they mean between 10 and 20 billion dollars. Okay, thank you very much for, for, for that comment. And then, Yafeng. Is it on? Is it off? Yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, my, my question to the two speakers are that uh, do you think that it in, in its relation with China, uh, should the, the United States play uh, promoting democracy and human rights as an important mission? Uh, the reason I ask this question is that uh, many of you know the recent episode in U.S.-China relations that uh, the human rights, uh, uh, the human rights lawyer, uh, the blind lawyer uh, Chen Guangcheng, who who uh, went to U.S. embassy. Now he was uh, under China's law. He was under house arrest. The American embassy officials uh, secretly uh, worked with him and his supporters and escorted him secretly to American embassy, which crea created this huge crisis uh, on the eve of uh, Secretary of State uh, Hin uh, Hillary Clinton's visit to China and also the important uh, U.S.-China strategic and economic dialogue. Uh, the, um, uh, the Chinese uh, foreign ministry official accused the United States meddling in Chinese internal affairs and uh, uh, because the China, uh, it says that, that because the United States did not want to see China's rise and China become important. Thank you. Okay, and let's go to Ann uh, Peters there. Ann. Good afternoon, Ann Phillips, Phillips a public student, policy. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. New here at the Wilson Center. Question for both of our speakers, a very different kind of question. Um, and that is the question of what role, if any, do you think perception of other actors in the international environment play in the ability of the U.S. to translate these objective measures of power that you both listed into influence. Is that clear? Thank you. Thank you. Let's give our, uh, we're getting close to the end, but we'll give each of them a, a final uh, opportunity to respond to that sort of uh, Where we want Michael uh, start? Uh, kind of uh, smorgasbord of comments. Uh, uh, but they, they really cluster into, yes, into a couple okay. categories. Well, um, the, uh, it, it, the, the problems of entitlements, health care costs, energy, all have political solutions. Uh, anybody who is optimistic that those political solutions will be applied in the United States in the near future must be from out of town. Uh, <laughs> The gentleman here, I, I'm not, I, if I understood him correctly, he was suggesting that immortality is just around the corner, in which case uh, we can all think about second and third careers. Uh, and uh, in any event, I, I'm not uh, uh, competent to uh, pronounce on that. Peter, we've had great debates in this country, like over, over whether, whether to uh, you know, abolish slavery or not. But, I mean, Basically, if the Bush tax cuts went away at the end of this year, you know, the, the, the deficit would be projected to be reduced by half or something like that. I mean, it's, it's a couple percentage points, you know, can get you a lot of leverage in dealing with these problems. Now, our politics may be intractable, in, 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 in but uh, when, did you want to comment on the China piece well, of it? Well, uh, I, yeah, I mean, on immortality, I just, I, I do I'm teach at Johns favorite. Hopkins, but not at the medical school, so I'm not competent <laughs> to uh, comment. Uh, on China, uh, the United States 
uh, well, three things. Uh, one, the United States pursues multiple goals, always has, always will. They often come in conflict. China is an example. Human rights sometimes conflicts with economic interests and with strategic interests, which means that conducting American foreign policy is uh, almost always a case of balancing and juggling, and that's true in the case of China. As for democracy and human rights, the United States stands for democracy and human rights, and in dramatic cases such as this gentleman cannot turn its back on its values. On the other hand, uh, the future of democracy and human rights in China depends on the Chinese, not on the United States. We don't have that kind of leverage. Uh, and as for the, uh, the charge that the United States is trying to prevent China's rise, uh, the United States is certainly not trying to prevent China's rise, or at least has, has been remarkably unsuccessful. Uh, it is discouraging when Chinese officials play the America card uh, because it's, which is uh, irrelevant to their problems because it suggests that they are trying to distract the populace from more mm -hmm. serious issues. Last word for you, Bob. Yeah, the, um, I agree with Michael that there are solutions available to deal with our health care and economic problems. The question is political will uh, and policy choice. If we had more time, we'd go into some detail. Uh, on education, um, uh, I'm old enough to remember the Sputnik moment, and people are people have always complained bitterly about our education. The generation I grew up, people said, "Oh, the younger generation's no damn good; they're out playing around and not studying hard enough." While the Russians are studying math and science and physics, and they put up the first man-made object, and here we're too undisciplined and lax, and so on. We have always had problems. We always will have problems. This is a vast country. Um, I think a lot of those numbers you cite, including the OECD study, grossly overst overstate the nature of America's problems. The problems that exist have more to do with cultural determinants than they have to do with uh, the types of things that are focused on. But the, um, I would therefore stress the importance of our research universities, our science and math, uh, our cutting edge technologies, and so on. I'm not cavalier about it. We need to make changes. Nonetheless, I think you can be too pessimistic. Um, we need to get a handle on the fiscal picture, but once more, there are, um, uh, there are uh, outcomes available. On China, again, I agree with Michael. I'd also note that the Chinese have severe problems of their own, which tells me that the, this tendency to project, to extrapolate China's breathtaking rise over the last three decades, as though it will continue indefinitely, is simply um, unrealistic and even foolish. The Chinese, by some estimates, had 180,000 civil disturbances last year over abuses of power, land issues, and many other questions. To pick on the United States as somehow uh, attempting to block their rise says everything about the problems, uh, domestic problems of China uh, and so on. At the same time, the United States needs to be true to its values and to balance both its ideals and self-interest in these matters. Finally, about uh, and, and Philip's question uh, about foreign perceptions of the United States. Yes, that matters, but the U.S. still has enormous influence. If you look out at the world, not just at America's NATO allies, but other countries, and try to do a balance sheet about those countries that look toward the United States in some positive way about values, commonalities, security, human rights, non-proliferation, uh, the, the assumptions about um, uh, values we, we hold, far more countries tend to lean toward the United States than against, against it. Um, but it's also wise to remember that even at the pinnacle of American power, both immediately <clears throat> post-Cold War and at the height of our power during the Cold War, there were any number of instances in which we failed to get our way. Power does not necessarily mean you get the outcomes you want, whether it's the Korean War, Vietnam, disagreeing with General de Gaulle in France, and so forth. But the combination of America's um, uh, unique position in the world that Michael and I have talked about um, and what it brings to the table is unmet by any other country. And the alternative to American leadership is not that another country or institution will play that role, but if we, do, we don't, no one will, and the consequences will be adverse both for us and for other others.
Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Michael. It's been an excellent discussion. I'd like to thank all of you for attending today and participating. There, the book is uh, Power and Willpower. Copies are available outside. There's also a reception at which the uh, author will be available to sign copies. Please join me in thanking our speakers for an excellent presentation today. Yeah.